welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny, and Dolly, because you asked if you could see how Dolly is doing, how Puppy's doing. She's like, perfect. I don't want to kind of exaggerate. I don't want to exaggerate. I mean, perfection is a difficult thing to achieve, but she's achieved it, so she's good. She's running around when I record, so you sometimes may hear scuttling, like a scuttling sound, like I've got an infestation of rats, for example, but I haven't got an infestation of dollies. So anyway, I'm gonna put her on the floor now, but you asked, and I've delivered. If nothing else, I listen to what you say. Today I'm gonna to be covering, wow, a case I hadn't heard of. I know a lot about serial killers. I have a whole tour at the moment that if you wanna see in the UK, you can see. I'll link it below. So if you do fancy an evening with me talking all about serial killers, how they're formed, what ingredients list creates them, and also how to avoid them, then look it up. It's so much fun doing my tour. I absolutely love meeting you guys as well. But this case is one I wasn't that aware of. I kind of had heard about it a little bit, but I wasn't acutely aware of it. And I'm going to be honest, I could have researched this for a month and I could have done several videos on it. That's how extensive this case is. Well, they all are to some degree. And it has a lot of twists and turns that arguably could have taken me in many directions. But I have tried to deep dive, but still keep it so that it's in one video. Because obviously, I like doing them all in one as opposed to breaking them up. Thanks, by the way, to everybody who comes every single time, gets involved in my live chat. If you haven't been on my live chat, why not come? Give me a like, give me a comment, give me a subscription. But genuinely, thank you as ever. Really, really appreciate it. Let's get on with today's true crime. Well, I guess to start, I would say this, there's no doubt whatsoever that Daniel Harold Rowling was a monster. He is a brutal serial killer. And when I put him up there with Ted Bundy and Richard Ramirez, it's for really, really good reason. However, I know you guys are massive true crime knowledgeable fans, so I appreciate that some of you will know this case intimately and intricately. But I don't think he's as well known as those infamous characters. And I'm sure that for some of you, you'll be hearing about him for the first time today. And maybe that's because his killings took place over a relatively short period of time. Certainly didn't receive the sustained publicity of other prolific serial killers because of that. However, wow, his killings, to say they were another level is probably incorrect because when you murder people as a serial killer that individual dies in pain and terror but there is something unusual about what he did with those people that he murdered and they were so heinous for those individuals who found his victims that he actually was the inspiration behind the slasher movie franchise scream Think Drew Barrymore making popcorn in a kitchen. Last thing she did in that film, that's all I'm saying. But essentially, as much as Scream is a bit of a parody, if you imagine the horror that you would actually go through if you were killed in such a way, and then translate this to the fact that what I'm talking about today is absolutely what happened to these individuals, it sends chills down your spine, doesn't it? And his actions in the killings were so infamous, it actually earned him the moniker, the Gainesville Ripper. And when I describe these cases, you'll know absolutely why. His crimes would literally still haunt the investigating officers who were on this case three decades on. And that's how traumatizing they were. Whenever we look at these kind of people, we always ask ourselves, how were they created? Is it possible to look at violent offenders and see that pen portrait of possibility, exploring the traits, the environmental, the experiential of those offenders when they were kids? He had a really traumatic childhood, I'm not gonna lie. So 
Let's go back. Rowling was born on the 26th of May, that was in 1954. His mother Claudia was just 19 when she had him and his dad was not a very nice human being. He was very abusive, he was incredibly controlling. He was called James, his father, and he was actually a police officer and he was also a Korean War veteran. So I suppose if we're thinking about James, then we could imagine that if he'd been in scenarios where he was at war and he'd also been in services, there is a chance that he could have been suffering from something like PTSD and that could have certainly exacerbated certain traits within him aggression wise. So potentially Rowling would have been affected by his father in that context. It could just be that James was a heinous human being. A lot of our serial killers have those for parents. Rowling grew up in Shreveport or Shreveport, I think it's probably Shreveport really, in Louisiana. And that was with his parents and his younger brother Kevin. It was made clear to Rowling by his dad from the moment that they could communicate with one another that he hadn't been wanted. I mean, the abuse just in that exchange is profound. What kind of a parent goes out of their way to make such a fracture in the foundations of a young child's mind, in a young child's experience family-wise? But that's exactly what James was like. He was a horrible bully. And I do think that we can't underestimate the impact that that would have on Rowling, being told you were literally not wanted. And James wasn't just nasty to Rowling, he was nasty to the entire family. He was a huge domestic abuser. He was very, very violent. And it was recognized in the family that it took the tiniest thing to create the hugest and dramatic of violent reactions. He frequently beat them for the tiniest reason ever. And I'll give you some examples just so you kind of connect with how outside the realm of acceptability James was as a father. So if he didn't like the way they were breathing, that was one. Didn't like the way that they were holding their cutlery or the way that they were sitting. They were all reasons for James to just mindlessly and violently attack his children. I think that for anybody who comes from a home that has been abusive, these kind of incidences do not surprise you. You're individuals who yourselves realized that domestically violent perpetrators, they are looking for a reason to harm you. But for people who've been blessed to be brought up with secure attachment, where a parent has been a primary caregiver and has made you feel safe and loved, can you imagine how it would feel to be that child? where literally breathing or sitting incorrectly would result in violence. And where Rowling is concerned, this violence didn't start as a teenager. It started when he was literally at crawling age. So at a primary developmental stage, it's always completely inappropriate, uncalled for, reprehensible to be violent to your children per se. But when they are literally a crawling stage, well, one, how problematic can they really be? They are fully within your control and they don't act out at that age to any degree that should cause even mild annoyance. But the fact that also, if you're being violent towards a child at that prime age, the chance is that you're going to do some damage to the way that they develop, both mentally because of their experience environmentally, but also physically and brain-wise, because if you're being aggressive, shaking a child, hitting a child, pushing a child, these are all things that can massively impact on brain development. And one of the things that really annoyed James about his son was that instead of actually crawling in a typical fashion, as children tend to, he would actually do differently. He'd pull himself along on his bottom with one leg, and lots of mums and dads will appreciate that they've seen their own children do that. Not all kids crawl, genuinely. Some kids shuffle and then they stand and then they walk. It's whatever works. And certainly it seems like Rowling fitted that category, but it drove his father mad. 
So he was so incensed that on one occasion he grabbed Rowling by the leg and shoved him bouncing down the hallway. That's the kind of violence this little baby was dealing with on a daily basis. He would also hit his sons with a belt, which in this modern day is harrowing, but back in the 70s and 80s, it did seem that parents had a penchant for hitting people with belts who were their family members. I genuinely have lots of friends who used to get slapped that way. It's like some kind of weird corporal punishment that they all agreed with in the 70s was a good idea. I would just prefer it if you kept your belt on and just kept your trousers up with it. But nonetheless, the incidence of people hitting kids with belts, fortunately, has dropped to negligible because, well, it's considered illegal. Also, he would make fists and grind his knuckles into their heads. And if they dared to cry, because they were babies and children, and that's how you let your primary caregivers know that you're not happy with what's happening, but if they dared to, well, they'd get punished even more. So psychologically, their life, living at home with their father, was just constant violence and fear. It was absolutely, without doubt, a highly unsatisfactory world for either child to inhabit, and it must have been terrifying. Also, it feels like James just wanted to steal the joy out of his children's lives, so they weren't allowed birthday parties, which, again, some people will understand that parents don't have the financial opportunity to create birthday parties. Some people will have religious beliefs that suggest that birthday parties aren't part of their faith. But for the most part, guys, you know, a birthday party is pretty important for a child. Jam sandwiches, bag of crisps, it really doesn't have to be anything incredible. What matters is kids get to have their friends around and they feel part of something greater than the individual. It's just what childhood is about. And ultimately, I do think that James used birthday parties and preventing them having them just as more torture, simple as that, letting them know that their happiness was beholden to him, per se and he could prevent them from enjoying the small childhood pleasures that every child should be entitled to. Also, even though James was violent to all family members, it seems like he had a particular penchant for wanting to hurt Rowling more than anybody else. And when he got a little bit older, this is an example of what I think is unforgivable action towards his son. Because as Rowling got older, he got a pet dog and his dad had basically found this dog at work and this meant a lot to Rowling. But James, at one point, in a violent rage, beat that poor defenseless animal so much that ultimately it died in his arms. I mean, can you imagine how that would feel? That Rowling was stood there holding a dog that he loved that he'd been given by his father. And I think, imagine what that would be like for a child who struggles to have a relationship with a parent anyway. And then suddenly you're presented with an opportunity to care for a dog. We all know what dog relationships are like. It makes you feel like you've got a friend who just loves you and accepts you even when you're not the greatest mood or you're not the greatest person because you're having a bad time. That's what dogs are brilliant at. And the fact that his father gave him the dog that would have meant a huge amount. It would have spoke volumes because they didn't really have a relationship. And I would imagine that Rowling was seeking some kind of connection. And then to have that taken away in such a violent way, well, that denotes two things. One, it's again a further abandonment of James to Rowling. And secondly, it's agonizing grief for Rowling as a child that he loses something that ultimately was like his best friend. And on another occasion, which may slightly blow your mind, is he actually held Rowling face down on the floor, he handcuffed him, and he called his police colleagues to have him taken away. Hello? I need you to come here. Why, James? You won't believe it. I've had to arrest my child. Why? I've literally got no good reason at all, but can you come and take him away? will be there in five. And they literally did that. Yeah. Basically, his reasoning behind calling 
his colleagues was because he felt embarrassed and ashamed of his son. Yeah, who knew? Who knew there was a whole area of the law dedicated to your emotional feelings about your child? Throw away the key! Actually, ironically, if they had thrown away the key, it probably would have been a good idea. This is the only time where the police turning up and taking a child and then locking him up and throwing away the key may well have actually been the best course of action. I digress. But the point is, this kind of abuse would have been terrifying. I don't know about you guys. Maybe I shouldn't say this. I'm going to say this. If my sister's watching, she'll be like, oh my God. Remember that moment so vividly. When me and my sister were naughty, when we were kids, and don't judge my father for this, guys, it was a different time era. But if we were like acting out and we were like little, you know, I was probably about three, she might have been like seven. What my dad would do if we didn't behave was he'd be like, right, call him Matron Clancy. And Matron Clancy was the woman who ran the orphanage. And he'd get on the phone to Matron Clancy. And me and my sister would just be begging him, don't do that, please don't do that. And obviously he would, in the end, accept that we were going to behave and we'd just get back to behaving because obviously we didn't want Matron Clancy coming and getting us. Obviously there was no Matron Clancy, but when you're three and seven, it seems like a rational idea that your parents can just ship you off. What I'm saying is we know that at times parents can use psychological warfare to some degree on their children. But what we're talking about with somebody like Rowling is it was constant, it was perpetual, it was upsetting on a daily basis and also clearly demonstrable by what happened with calling his colleagues. He didn't take any prisoners whatsoever with emotions where his kids were concerned. It didn't matter that Rowling was dealing with this constant aggression and violence he wanted to also manipulate him psychologically. Don't judge my dad. He's a really nice guy. Just saying. Different time era. I would never do that with my kids. But Matron Clancy, don't be any of you taking that and using it with your own children. But again, just giving you that ingredients list of what created this individual. And one of his school counsellors actually said that he was suffering from what they considered an inferiority complex with aggressive tendencies and poor impulse control, which is unsurprising when you think about what I've just described being his daily life. That school counsellor said that there was a really important strategy that needed to be created to help him, which was that they needed to deal with these nervous character and personality problems, as they put it, and that counselling was essential. They didn't get any. The family just didn't do anything to ensure that those needs were met. And again, therapy is not going to resolve the fact that you're living with people who are treating you so diabolically, but it can give you an outlet at least to express your dissatisfaction and unhappiness. And it can also lead to children being removed from home if they start to disclose the violence that they're enduring. So at that moment in time, if those kind of strategies have been put in place and implemented, and he had been able to sit down with a counselor and talk it through, then there would have likely been a very different outcome. But they don't want any outside interference, so no therapy ensued. Now, it may not surprise you to discover that Rowling's mother often left his father because she was living with somebody borderline psychopathic. On one occasion, she actually even ended up going to hospital and she'd cut her wrists with razor blades. The fact that she felt so trapped and so depressed and so lost that she ended up cutting her wrists is just really devastating for any child to see, but also gives us an insight into how awful she felt her life was. And even though she did that, even though she felt that devastated about her world, it wasn't enough to stop her returning. You know, he was constantly abusive towards her as a husband but she went back to him. Arguably, things have changed. These days, divorce isn't something that anybody really gets judged for. And also, women can make their own money, so they're not reliant on a partner. 
And of course, society accepts this. So you don't feel ashamed of your actions if you choose to walk away. But I think things were incredibly different 50 years ago. It's as simple as that. And most of us can remember a time, if we're a certain age, where people literally didn't even speak about their personal problems. It was just not done. It's so weird that the world used to be like that. But genuinely, personal problems were like kept private completely. So Rowling will also have experienced an inconsistent parenting experience. Mum wasn't there sometimes, mum was ill sometimes. And then when she came home, she did absolutely nothing to protect him. He was basically trapped constantly in this really abusive environment. So his father was incredibly violent and his mother just allowed it to happen. There was no safety, no protective mechanism, no sense of being valued, no sense of being protected. All the things that children need to even begin their journey of thriving. When you also look at Rowling's development as a young person, it really does seem like a lot of serial killers, his criminal behavior began when he was quite young. So like Ted Bundy, he was a voyeur, actually got caught lots and lots of times just watching women undress through their windows. So we see that voyeuristic connection because it's a massive violation. The fact that somebody is stalking you and sneaking through your shutters to kind of see what you're doing taking your clothes off. On one level, it's not physical. You're not actually having contact with that individual. It's not a contact crime, but it's a massive violation sexually. It's somebody feeling that they have a right to observe you when you're not even aware that they are doing when you're in a vulnerable position. But he was doing that early on. And what we see in those kind of non-contact crimes early on is that they tend to grow into something that's contact based as people get older and their needs become more perverted. So his offending behavior begins to escalate to more serious offenses. And he first of all starts getting arrested for various robberies, that's in Georgia. And that's clearly not a sexual crime. But if you add to it the fact that he spent time being a voyeur, trying to find women in vulnerable states, and then he's breaking into homes, is he at this point homing his skills so that he can carry out the future crimes I'm going to talk about? Certainly, it seems like he was excited by being somebody who invaded a person's private space, whether that was as a voyeur looking through a window or whether that was during a home invasion. As Roland grew, one of the things that a lot of people who knew him say is that he became a real social outcast, didn't fit in, was somebody who was considered a loner. He found it very difficult to hold down a steady job. He did actually work briefly as a waiter, but it wasn't that he had a very consistent approach to employment. Rowling did spend a couple of years in the US Air Force. That was just after high school, but he ends up getting dishonorably discharged in 1972. He got arrested for drug possession. And then he does manage to meet somebody to a point where they decide to marry him. This is in 1974, and they go on to have a daughter. It won't surprise you to know with the foundations that he experienced in his life that the relationship didn't succeed. He was allegedly violent in that relationship. Again, let's just put it out there and be clear. The vast majority, and I mean staggeringly, the vast majority of people who experience violence in their childhoods do not go on to be violent in relationships and by a vast amount. So even though he's got these horrific fractures in his childhood and he didn't deserve any of them, the fact that he becomes a perpetrator says something about his nature. You always have a choice. And he chooses to carry on the pattern, not to break it. So they get divorced in the late 1980s. One of the things that I would say about Rowling was he did have a creative flair. So he was really good at playing the acoustic guitar and I think that that was partly to do with the fact that when he was playing music, he had an escape, he had an outlet, 
getting away from the horrors of his home life was clearly very important to him and just escaping with music was important. And ironically, as much as what we're going to be talking about today is a serial killer and a psychopathic one at that, because they all are, it's also worth noting that where music is concerned, there is a whole arena in therapy of music therapy because it doesn't matter whether you get involved in singing or playing an instrument or just like pumping out your favorite tunes. It has the same impact on mood, which is to increase the happiness index. So music is very therapeutic and clearly for him, that's the case. He's actually an aspiring country music singer, which is massive in the States. But in spite of that side to him, the other side was that he was a ticking time bomb. Simple as that. A time bomb that was going to reach its climax in 1990. And that was when he was 36 years old. One thing I will mention about Rowling, because it's not going to get better from here, guys. I'm not going to be like, oh, Rowling decided that it was going to be a good idea to go and volunteer and become an active part in his local community. And he really did live out his days being respected by everyone and being pro-social. You know the story is not going to go like that. So I may as well introduce like one thing about him that actually was pretty neat. He was like his mother in one way. He was very creative and he was a really good acoustic guitar player. And that literally helped him during those really difficult times times regarding thinking about his past and surviving the horrible family life that he'd experienced, it gave him a level of escape. He also had this dream, he wanted to be an aspiring country music singer. And I think we can all agree that psychologically, the reason that there is a whole paradigm that is devoted to music therapy in the therapeutic arena is because music is incredibly powerful. It is incredibly cathartic, it's connecting, and actually there's a lot of research on it that says whether you sing yourself, whether you play an instrument, whether you just pump out your favorite tunes, the impact on the happiness index of individuals who do that is higher than those who don't engage in music. So there is a real healing where that is concerned. But in spite of this talent, and in spite of this hopeful vision that he may have had from time to time about filling stadiums, being a country music singer, which is massive in the States. I mean, country music is enormous. In spite of the fact he has this side to him, there's also this other side, which is just a ticking time bomb. And things, within him in that context reached this climax in 1990s when he's 36. It is actually around the time that his marriage ends. So certainly what we can say there is there would have been a high level of stress because clearly when you're starting to go through divorce proceedings, it's usually a little bit on the contentious side. For any of you who may have been through divorce, as I have, it can be a little bit on the aggravating kind of level and it can be scary and all the other things that go with that. So yeah, there is some more stress around those kind of endings. And what do we know about serial killers and violent offenders? The more stressed they are, the more likely they are to offend. So we can make that connection. And in May of that year, so 1990, he actually attempts to kill his abusive father during a family argument. He actually had been chased by his dad from his dad's house at gunpoint. So Rollinger then returned with his own gun and shot him. And it was a serious attack. It wasn't somebody just letting you know that they were not going to take it anymore. It wasn't power play. This was a scenario where he shot him in the head and in the stomach and his dad lost an eye and he lost an ear. So. That's high level offending, isn't it? And don't get me wrong, there was a bit of me that's like, well, if you go around beating the crap out of your kid, if you use a bell, if you threaten them, if you get your mates to pop down from the cop shop to take him away because, I don't know, I was a bit embarrassed about your behavior and so on and so forth. And then you think as they grow into an adult, you can continue that kind of treatment without any kind of retaliation, you are seriously delusional. And in this case, I think that James, to some degree, got what he deserved. I know it's reprehensible. 
I know it's unacceptable and I certainly know it's illegal. They are moral stances and they are, of course, legal stances. But the point is we're talking about emotional and Rowling had been horrifically abused for many, many years and this was his tipping point. This was the, I'm not taking it anymore. Police obviously issue a warrant for his arrest. You can't go around shooting somebody's eye out and ear off. It's not okay. Under any circumstances, in spite of the fact we can have some empathy and sympathy for what formed Rowling, the point is he really did try to kill his father. So Rowling then flees to Florida, obviously on the run. Just three months after that, this is August 1990, this is when the killings begin. So first of all, there's this burglary and robbery spree in Gainesville, Florida, but then this turns into what can only be described on reflection as a murderous rampage. And he would target young female university students, a bit like Ed Kemper. So he went for a specific type of young female and all of his victims, aside from one, they all resembled his mum. They were petite brunettes, they had brown eyes. So whether he was consciously playing out, seeking victims that reflected the rage that he felt to his mother because she had failed to protect him, or whether it was genuinely that he had an attraction for women who had a look of his mother. I mean, that isn't unusual. It's not that somebody's going out trying to find a partner who looks like a parent. It's just that familiarity is one of the things that causes attraction. So understandably, people who looked a certain way it could have just been that he found them more attractive as victims. But I would be remiss to note that often serial killers have got big issues with their mothers and it seems at times they choose victims who remind them of that parent. So these petite brunettes with these brown eyes to some degree have connection with his past because of the way that his mother looked. And he developed the most brutal MO and probably one of the most unique signatures that I think the world of serial killing has ever really encountered. It was just so utterly shocking. So on the 24th of August, 1990, this is when the university term in autumn is just about to begin. And there are two University of Florida freshmen, that 17 year old Christina Christy, she was called actually, but Christina Powell and 18 year old Sonia Larson. They just moved, in fact, into the Williamsburg apartment complex and they had done what a lot of students did, met each other, realized that they wanted to find somewhere to live and felt that they'd become roommates. They tried to get into dorms, but they were awful. So they ended up living off campus. In the early hours of the morning, Rowling breaks into their apartment. He uses a screwdriver and a knife just to prise open the back door. As we know, as I talked about before, he had done home invasions before. So because he committed property offences, he knew how to get in. He was schooled in that area. And he was cool, calm and collected because it was something that he'd done many times before. But this was going to play out very differently to those crimes that I talked about earlier on. He went in armed with an automatic pistol and a Marine Corps K-bar combat knife. Christy was asleep on the couch, just as you do. She'd just fallen asleep. And Rowling briefly stood over her but then leaves her on that couch, obviously secure that she's asleep, but feeling the fact that he's got that power, that she's completely unaware, unconscious to the reality of what is about to play out. Imagine being so confident as a perpetrator that you can literally be stood near a sleeping victim and not in that moment feel that you need to take the opportunity to harm them in that moment because you know they could wake up. No, to be confident enough to look, take the image of that person in, and then to walk away 
which is exactly what he does because he quietly makes his way upstairs to where Sonia is sleeping. He stabs her in the chest and then, as you would imagine, she comes round in terror, but he puts tape on her mouth because he wants to muffle her screams. And then he tells her exactly what he's going to do to her. Yeah, one of the really sadistic features of his crimes is that he would subject all of his victims to this, to telling them in detail what he was going to do, how their life was going to end. And remember, these are people who've had no warning that somebody's in their home. They're literally coming round to this horror, like out of the worst nightmare, but they're living it, they're breathing it. They're taking their last breaths in it. After he's told her what he's going to do to her, he then stabs her multiple times with the combat knife. And that woman had defense wounds to her arms, so she was trying to fend him off. She was dealing with that scenario as best as she could by fighting like hell. She had slash wounds to her left thigh, obviously defense wounds all over her hands, and her muffled screams would not have been heard because he'd placed the tape around her mouth. Now, he's just killed Sonia. He isn't in a state of panic. He isn't trying to run from the scene. He's not had his fill, shall we say. No, he just quietly makes his way downstairs, emboldened now because he's already had that kill. And he gets to Christy, she's still asleep. He then tapes her mouth. He binds her hands behind her back, cuts off her clothes with the knife. He then gropes her, he makes her perform oral sex on him, and then he rapes her. All the while, he's threatening her with that knife. And then after he's had his violent fun, after he sadistically murdered her roommate, her friend, after he's violated her in the most horrific of ways, he forces her to lie down on the floor, face down, and then he stabs her five times in the back killing her. But he's not finished. He's not finished. This is not a man who is worried about time. So he returns to Sonia's dead body and then he has sex with a corpse. And before leaving, he actually takes a shower in their apartment, which is grotesquely arrogant. Also, you can hear in that moment that He's thinking forensically. He's imagining how important it is at this point to remove evidence from his own body. And getting that shower is a way he will believe of doing so. Now, those poor young women's bodies lay undiscovered for two days. And it was only when both girls' parents ultimately became concerned because they hadn't heard from the daughters and this was massively out of character. But because they hadn't actually had a phone line installed, it meant that the parents were worried, but they couldn't contact them directly. This meant that Christie's parents ultimately called by the apartment and they were banging on her door. They got no reply. Clearly, that would have been absolutely terrifying, but you'd be thinking about the best, which is maybe they're just not in, maybe they're at university and so on and so forth. Anything to imagine that your child is gonna come home safe. So then they actually managed to meet with the maintenance man and the building manager, which obviously means that this is an individual that can give them some access. Now that maintenance man and the building manager actually advise them to wait for the police because they obviously suspect this could be something that isn't good that's going to play out and maybe the police are the best people to actually connect with. But the maintenance man eventually breaks down the door. They enter the apartment and then they're met with this most catastrophic sight. And I mean, I, honestly, what I'm going to disclose now will give you an insight into the grotesque human that Rowling is. Because as I said, this wasn't a man panicked in those murders. This was a man who took his time. There is a level of enjoyment in what he does with the bodies that is blindsidingly shocking. It really is. 
So they enter this apartment and the maintenance man actually runs out screaming all the way down the hall, oh my God, and then he throws up. Now that is such a visceral, cerebral impact, isn't it? That I have never seen anything like this before and his whole body couldn't manage it. The fact that he's vomiting demonstrates the level of impact and trauma. Now, remember, Christie's parents are outside the flat. And all they've seen is this man running, screaming, oh my God, and being violently sick. You wouldn't need any more insight to know that something dreadful has occurred. And what made this gruesome scene even more horrific is that both of the young women's bodies had been posed and they really had been posed. So we're not talking about, oh, could this person have done this to kind of shock somebody or is this just rigor mortis that has set in because maybe the legs were wide apart? No. Sonia was laying naked on her bed, on her back. Her legs were draped over the side of the bed. Her hands were above her head very sexualized position. Her hair had then all been fanned around her head. So that in itself is almost creating theater with the bodies. The medical examiner who examined the body later said that her killing had basically been a blitz style attack. He said that she would have been alive for about 30 to 60 seconds. That might seem short, but I think we can all agree if you were being serially murdered by a man literally blitz knifing you, it would feel like a lifetime. Downstairs, they found Christy and she'd actually been left again in a similar position. But what they were also able to note was there had also been some post-mortem mutilation. Christy's nipples had actually been sliced off and one had been taken. Now this posing that I've just described of his victims being in a really sexualized, suggestive manner, along with the post-mortem mutilation, that would actually become something very representative of Rowling's signature. Also, they were able to find that there was tape residue, so they could see that even though there wasn't tape on the victims, because of this residue, it was clear that they had been taped up and they'd been able to be restrained because of it but they know it, that it had actually been taken away by the perpetrator. So they instantly know this person is trying to be forensically sophisticated. They want to avoid DNA and fingerprints being left. Also, like I said, this guy took time. Both of the bodies had been wiped down with a cleaning agent. This was after they died. And again, that's another thing that linked this individual to the killings. It was characteristic of his killings. Underwear had also been taken. Clearly, the individual wanted a trophy. So we've got nipples being taken. We've got underwear being taken. Now, when they searched the property, they actually found a paper towel. And there was, on that paper towel in the kitchen, Rowling's semen. So as much as he thought he literally covered it and got rid of all incriminating evidence, he hadn't. Police also were able to find that he'd actually been hiding in the woods behind the apartment. So this meant that before he killed those two poor girls, he was actually stalking them. He was waiting for the right opportunity to strike. And it always makes me feel really uncomfortable when I imagine that there are these individual victims, they have absolutely no idea that the minutes to their death are ticking away, and yet there is an individual who is going to take their lives just watching them. And those girls knew nothing about it. They were just going about their business, just falling asleep on a couch, just getting on with their young lives. And all the while, this predator, this human predator, was just waiting to strike. Understandably, the local community were stunned. They were shocked by these utterly brutal killings. One, it was a murder of two students on the same occasion. This is very unusual anyway. The logistics of murdering people, very complicated. People are unpredictable. 
it's very difficult to overpower two people at once if they're both about to go crazy and attack you back. These are all things that can mean that you avoid scenarios like this. You might just go for one person, but no, this was two who'd been attacked. But also, it was the fact that they were so twisted. There was such a level of sadism in the killing, sadism that was almost unheard of. But if that local community thought that it was going to end there, well, they were very, very wrong. So in the meantime, Rowling had continued his murder spree. This is the evening of Saturday, the 25th of August, 1990. That's just 42 hours after killing Christian Sonia. He's back again. So Rowling breaks in to an apartment of 18-year-old Santa Fe Community College student, Krista Lee Hoyt. She, he was armed with that same pistol, with the same combat knife as in the previous murders. And he basically spotted Krista a few days earlier and he'd been spying on her in her apartment. Krista Hoyt was actually hoping one day to become a police officer. And it really mattered to her to the degree where she ended up in between her studies working as a part-time records clerk at the Alachua County Sheriff's Office. So she was kind of connected with law and order, even at that point. Now, similar to before, he used the same kind of MO. He used a screwdriver to prise open the sliding glass door of her apartment. Once he actually managed to get in, well, he discovers that Krista actually isn't home. This is what I mean about his confidence and arrogance, by the way, because in that moment, when he realizes that she isn't home, you would think maybe he felt thwarted, you know? Okay, this is a sign. I need to leave because the victim isn't here. But no, he had stalked her. He had locked in on his victim. She was the person that he found attractive to his needs to meet that insatiable growing desire to murder. He just waits. He just lay in wait for her to return. 11 a.m., Krista returns. She enters her apartment. She's completely unsuspecting. Once she's in, Rowling attacks her from behind. He places her in a chokehold, and after a brief struggle, he manages to subdue her. Anybody will know if somebody gets you from behind in a chokehold, particularly when you have absolutely no suspicion that someone is going to do that, they have complete power and they can choke you out really easily. So even though she struggles and fights, he obviously has the upper hand. Now, following his previous MO, he tapes a mouth, he binds her hands behind her back, and then he takes her into the bedroom. He cuts off her clothes and he rapes her, all the while threatening her with the knife. As with Christina, he lays her face down on the bed and then he stabs her multiple times in the back. One of the wounds actually severed her aorta. That's the main artery that carries blood from your heart to the rest of your body. So she rapidly bled to death. As with the previous victims that I talked about, he then mutilated her body. And using a knife, he sliced her from her breastbone all the way down to her pubic bone and he disemboweled her. So this growing fixation and interest of the internal workings of the women that he's murdering. And of course, one can only make suggestions as to why he wants to do that. But if you imagine slicing somebody from their breastbone to the pubic bone, it kind of travels all the way through the organs that makes a woman a woman. If you're slicing down all the way through the belly button to the pubic bone and then disemboweling, that's where you create life, isn't it? That's where you grow your babies in your womb. Your breasts are also very much part of being maternal. And he's choosing girls that look a little bit like his mother. Is this that rage that he feels towards the female form and the fact that his own marriage is broken down as well? So he has this projection onto taking out the rage and completely dehumanizing the women 
absolutely decimating the very areas that makes us who we are. Imagine as well what's happening in those moments for people walking into that scene and actually seeing that kind of trauma. He then returns to the makeshift campsite that is actually erected in the woods where he's been spying on these women. This is behind Florida University. And he realizes that he thinks he's lost his wallet. Instantly decides that maybe he's left it in Krista's apartment. This is how insanely, insanely confident he is about what he's doing because he just goes back to the crime scene. And if it's not enough that he goes back to check whether he's left his wallet or not, he then takes time to further mutilate Krista's body and it's in the most utterly horrific way. And he said, when he's been interviewed about this later down the line, that the very reason that he did this was for one intention and one intention alone. He wanted to shock whoever discovered her body. And wow, would he succeed? Because within hours of discovering Christy and Sonia's bodies, Rowling's third victim is found. So this is just two miles away from the first killings. Krista, as we know what's happened to her at this point, but obviously the people who work with her, who know her, they are unaware of what's happened and played out. Krista's just basically failed to show up for her midnight shift at the sheriff's office on the evening of the 26th of August. Also, she wasn't answering her phone. It was completely out of character. She's actually found dead by two of her own colleagues. They go to check on her, to do a welfare check. They care for her. She's a friend and a colleague. When they get into her apartment, the sight that they are met with is straight out of a horror film. Straight out of a horror film. So when Rowling had gone back to search for that wallet, I told you he further mutilated her. What he actually did was he decapitated her and then he sexually posed her completely headless, naked, disemboweled, and he put her corpse on the edge of the bed so it looked like it was sitting, like bent over at the waist, hands on the thighs. She was still wearing shoes and socks. He then sliced off her nipples. He'd left them on the bed next to her. And then he'd taken her severed head and he'd placed it on a shelf positioned so it was facing the body as if the head was looking at the body. Now, as with the other victims, he'd also wiped down her body with a cleaning agent. And again, he'd taken the underwear as a trophy. But the level of intricacy about doing that to those bodies that we've seen so far, three women posed sexually, all to shock the person who has the misfortune to walk in on the individuals that they cared for. Now, investigators at this point think, hey, we have got a serial killer on our hand. It's as simple as that. You don't get three people killed in a short space of time, all with similar injuries to their bodies and posed, unless it's the same person. I mean, crimes like these were incredibly rare in the city of Gainesville anyway, but crimes that are so macabre, so despicable, and clearly so linked are completely unheard of. And also, these have happened near the university campus, and that is unusual as well because of the footfall, that it's a busy area, so there isn't the same kind of opportunity for people to get away with this kind of thing. They start hunting immediately for this killer because they're very, very aware that there looks like there is somebody who is going to strike again. And they start reporting the crimes in the media. This sent, and I mean it, it's an absolute panic through local residents. And they started referring to the killings as the Gainesville Ripper killings. And it just hit the headline. It went massive. You know, there was basically a monster on the loose and 
it was so profoundly disturbing for the students. They start traveling together in groups. Also, loads of increased sales of mace occurred. So people were looking at how to protect themselves. And some students were that terrified by what had gone on. They literally transferred to other universities or they just went home, which I have to say, I may have chosen to do too. I think it's really hard to place yourself in those positions, isn't it? What would you do if you discovered that there was some brutal serial killer out and about in your local community, breaking into apartments and murdering the residents, and you happen to fit the look of that particular victim, would you stay? I'd be like, immediately come and pick me up, dad. That would have been me I'm back in the days, and my God, he would have been there. That's absolutely a normal response, isn't it? Because if there is a human predator about and you fit that look and you can't defend yourself because you're a petite brunette, chances are you're just going to want to get as far away as possible. So this is going on throughout the local community. They even cancelled classes. And some students said that they started to sleep with knives under their pillows. I would have had a samurai sword. And in America, I would have had an arsenal of guns. And I'm a pacifist. But I would have been like, is it possible to get an AK-47? I don't even think they might have been existing at that point. I'm not really a gun person. But I would have wanted something at least semi-automatic, you know, just in case. And I would probably as well have barricaded myself in my room for good measure. You know, like they did in all the old cartoons where they just hammered lots of wood across doors to ensure that nobody could cross the threshold. Something a little bit like that. But the city genuinely becomes consumed by fear. They were absolutely right as well to be scared because in spite of the fact that this is hitting the headlines, in spite of the fact that essentially the police all over the state are looking, this killing spree is not about to end. So on the day that Christie's body is actually discovered, Rowling robs a bank. Yeah, he just, Half a mile away from Christie's home, he goes in and he holds a bank up. But during that robbery, the bank teller has the wherewithal to slip a red dye pack into the bag of money, which obviously means that you can't spend the money, which would be deeply frustrating if you were a bank robber. I'm not saying that I have any sympathy or empathy with bank robbers. I'm just saying that if you have actually managed to get away with it and then you open the bag and you're like, I can't use any because it's now covered in this crappy, crappy dye, it would be deeply frustrating. The moral of the story is, don't rob banks, kids. On the 27th of August, 1990, dead of the night at this point, it's around 3 a.m. in the morning, and this is just two days after the last killing, Rowling breaks into the apartment, shared by 23-year-old Florida University students, Manuel, known as Manny Taboda, and Tracy Pauls. Tracy was a pre-law senior, very bright. She wanted to be a lawyer, and Manny, well, Manny dreamed of becoming an architect. They've been really good friends since high school, and their apartment was literally just a mile from the previous two murder sites. Now, as before, Rowling uses a screwdriver to prise open the glass sliding door. He's also got his pistol with him and his combat knife. In one of the bedrooms, he finds Manny sleeping. He basically stabs him in the solar plexus. He penetrates his thoracic vertebrae. So this means that Manny is really severely injured, but he wakes up and he struggles, he fights. Now, when they look, at his body after his death, they see that he's got lots of defense wounds. It was absolutely clear that he tried to fend off the attack. He'd put up a considerable fight. He was actually a former football player. He was six foot three, he was over 200 pounds. But because he'd been taken by surprise initially, well, basically he didn't stand a chance. Rowling was six foot two, he was athletic. Also, he was armed. So he repeatedly stabbed him on the arms, in his hands, chest, legs, face. Eventually he died. In total, he was stabbed 31 times. Now, of course, Manny didn't go down easily. He went down loudly. So Tracy has heard this struggle. 
she ventures down the hallway to Manny's bedroom and she literally comes face to face with Rowling. Can you imagine that moment? I mean, not even in your worst nightmare would you think you're about to come face to face with the individual who's all over the news. The individual who's already killed three women. She sees him and he is literally covered from head to toe in her roommate's blood, in her friend's blood. She runs, she locks herself in her bedroom. She tries to barricade herself in, but Rowling just breaks through. She's terrified. And she actually says to him, you're the one, aren't you? And he replies, yeah, I'm the one. He follows his usual MO. He tapes her mouth, he binds her hands, he then cuts off her clothes, he rapes her, he threatens her with the knife, and then he stabs her three times in the back. Kills her. He drags her body from the bedroom, and just like with all his other victims, he poses her body in this sexually suggestive position on the hallway floor. As with the other killings, he wipes her body down with soap. Then he removes the tape from her hands and from her mouth. But when it comes down to Manny, he just leaves him in situ, just where he killed him. Because Tracy had been his target. Manny had just been an obstacle that needed to be disposed of. And that was something that he carried out without even giving it a second's thought. He just cut through Manny to get to the one that he found desirable. Interestingly, on this particular occasion, neither of the bodies were actually mutilated. And there is a belief that because of the noise that was going on, he got spooked or he felt that somebody was coming to interrupt him potentially. So he didn't have the opportunity to go ahead and mutilate the bodies. We'd be very surprised if he'd had the time that he wouldn't have done that. So it's likely he either feared he was about to be interrupted or he heard noises that made him think that somebody was coming. It is incredible that what I am describing is that within a 72 hour period, Rowling had stabbed to death five college students in their own apartments. You see, what is really striking about this kind of crime is that's what makes it unusual, where somebody is literally going into a place of somebody else's residence, breaking in and murdering them in the place that should be their sanctuary, their safe haven. It's what we all do. Look, we close our doors and our windows at night and we go to bed and we do not think for a minute that there is a chance that we will be taking our last breath at the hands of a murderer like this in our own home. It just doesn't figure. And it also says something about the level of confidence and arrogance of this individual, that he goes to them. He doesn't drag them off the street. He doesn't kidnap them. He doesn't coerce them into cars and then drive them to a place of death. He literally goes to them in their own home. So he killed five college students. He'd sexually assaulted three of them before killing them. At this point, the police are on high alert. Everyone wants to know why he hasn't been brought to justice. Why is he still on the loose? They need to catch him. City has become a media circus. Police were holding daily press conferences. They were trying to reassure the public that they'd had it all in hand. But man, did they need a suspect quickly. They really did. And you know what? When you want to find a suspect, you have a bias, don't you? You want to find the person who's causing this chaos. You want to bring that person to justice. And sometimes that can mean that you are looking for somebody that you can make fit the bill. Well, Ed Humphrey, he fitted that perfectly. He was a Florida University freshman. And yeah, he had a history of mental illness and he had been off his meds, had, had a long history of strange behavior. Sometimes he'd had violent emotional outbursts. Also, he was quirky. You know, he was known to dress in military attire. He'd often hang around the campus at night with a knife. 
And he had recently been evicted from the apartments where Tracy and Manny lived because he'd been aggressive. He even had scars on his face, which added to this suspicion that this was an individual who was atypical from the normal social expectations behavior wise, but actually it had those scars on his face because of a car accident. But you know, if you ever wanna create a perfect poster boy for the Gainesville Ripper, well, this guy essentially fitted it perfectly. And that actually started years of harassment and media attention for him and his family. Ed Humphrey got hounded. It's as simple as that. Humphrey was actually arrested by police following a physical run-in that he had with his grandmother during which apparently he hit her, allegedly. And when they search his room, they find magazines about guns, about knives, about girls. And they're like, whoa, this picture is coming together. The pieces of the puzzle are adding up. They seem to be fitting together perfectly. And somehow, the fact that, you know, he had magazines about guns, knives, and girls, because that obviously makes you a serial killer. My God, if you've got those, if you've got those bloody magazines written for lots of people, that's why they're a magazine, because people literally buy it about knives and guns, that there's literally an actual magazine about it, but that makes you very dangerous, very dangerous indeed if you're buying that kind of material. And I mean, if you're buying something with pictures of girls in, I mean, who do that? Who would buy books or magazines with even inappropriate pictures of women in? I mean, who would invent that? Guns, knives, porn, I mean, clearly. If you're somebody who reads magazines of guns, of knives, and you like a bit of porn, you're definitely a serial killer, particularly if you've had a car crash and got scars on your face. But that is genuinely what they believe. And he ends up all over the media, all over the media. He gets labeled as the Gainesville Ripper. This is also at a point where his grandmother is like, um, you know how I said that he hit me? Well, I may have been exaggerating just a little bit. And arguably now he's all over the papers being accused of being the Gainesville Ripper, which I really don't think he is. But it was like too late. He ends up being sentenced to 22 months in Chattahoochee State Hospital for the assault. Even though she said he didn't do it. Even though she withdrew that testimony, 22 months. And he's basically put in a place where the inmates are convicted murderers. He was just mentally unwell at times. And suddenly he loses two years of his life in the most devastating surroundings. At this point, as opposed to the police being like, shall we like, you know, figure out whether it could really be him? I don't know, let's test some alibis or talk to people who knew him. They were like, we should just build a case of murder around him. We should just like figure out how to make this guy who like looks like he's a murderer be a murderer. I mean, that seems like a good use of resources when there is a murderer out there who could strike at any point. But at the point that they start looking at DNA, I mean, at least they did have the DNA because it could have ended up that Ed Humphreys had an even worse outcome than he got. But because they have got the DNA and it doesn't match Humphreys, and they've obviously come from the crime scenes, even though DNA testing was still in its infancy at the time, they still had conclusive results because they found that the semen samples indicated that the killer had type B blood and Humphreys had type A. So, sorry Humphrey, sorry, sorry we've ruined your life, sorry that we've sent you to a really terrible hospital with lots of violent murderers, sorry we tried to create a case around you that had nothing to do with you, we're sorry that we ignored the fact that your grandma also said that she didn't get hit by you, sorry. I mean it must be really awful being somebody like him, like genuinely innocent. Okay, you sometimes acted out, 
but there is nothing in your history to suggest that you are some kind of bloodthirsty serial killer and yet you end up all over the papers and you know that saying where there's smoke there's fire it is amazing how many people hold on to that like somehow when you're wrongly accused there must have been a reason for it so now of course the plot thickens the police are looking at this point in different states as well because they need to connect the dots and fortunately at this point the police in louisiana contact the florida police about an unsolved triple murder now this had occurred the previous year in shreveport on the 4th of november 1989 and it was just a horrific murder and again very unusual for the area three members of the same family have been brutally murdered that was 55 year old william tom grissom his 24 year old daughter julie and his eight-year-old grandson, Sean. It's a little kid as well. William was actually a divorcee. He lived in the Southern Hills area and all he was thinking about at that moment in time was he was gonna retire. He'd also been battling throat cancer, so it was a chance for him to fully slow down, embrace an opportunity to no longer work and just relax, enjoy life. Julie was upwardly mobile. She was studying marketing at Louisiana State University and she had literally almost graduated. And Sean, well, Sean was just there because he was spending the weekend with his aunt and his granddad. And the reason for that was it was part of his birthday celebrations. Ugh, just always affects me when I think about that. Little eight-year-old boy, just with his extended family, being spoiled, enjoying his birthday celebrations, and this happens. All they've been doing was getting dinner ready. Someone breaks into the home and attacks them. Sean's mother actually had alerted the authorities because Sean didn't attend school on the Monday. That was the 6th of November. Of course, he should be there. And she couldn't contact her father. So the neighbours had been asked to check on the family. It's around 8.45 a.m. Neighbours go into the property see a body, instantly alert the police. When the officers arrive there, they find William's body it's slumped against the back door, as multiple stab wounds to his back and to his chest. Eight-year-old Sean, that little boy, he's in the living room, he hadn't been spared. He'd been watching TV when he was attacked and he basically was stabbed really severely. It was the wound that entered his back and exited through his chest. So it went straight through him, impaled him. Julie, well, she was clearly the intended victim. She was found naked on the bed. She'd been stabbed multiple times in the back. She was covered in bite marks that had been very ferocious. And her body, well, it was partially hanging off the bed. It had been wiped down with vinegar, very unusual. And what does that do? Well, it alerts the police that that crime and the crimes that they're dealing with bear a very, very, very similar connection to the ones that have happened in Gainesville. So when investigators actually look at these killings, they can see that they bear a striking similarity to the Gainesville murders because these three victims have been stabbed to death Julie's body has been mutilated. She's been wiped down with a cleaning agent. She's been posed. Also, when they look at what she looked like, she's a petite brunette. When they were able to collect the bodily fluids from the crime scene, it was discovered that the likely perpetrator was a blood type B. Again, same as the Gainesville murderer. So the Louisiana police at this point believe that they're searching for a psychologically disturbed man who had experience with crime scenes. That's what they believe. Now it seemed the serial killer that Florida police were looking for had clearly struck before. That's what they arrive at. The fact that this is an individual who has moved, who has gone elsewhere to continue those killings. There's just too many similarities. Now, at the time of the 1989 murders that I've just talked about, Rowlings was living just 10 minutes away from the Williams home. He'd moved back with his parents the previous year because his marriage had broken down. He was not welcomed, by the way, 
in his parents' home, but essentially he didn't have anywhere else to go. And he'd spent much of the last decade in prison for robbing things like grocery stores. So obviously he was very, very unpopular. In fact, he was still on probation. He'd served three years of a four year sentence for his last robbery. Also, he'd previously served time in Alabama prison for a robbery before that. He then fled to Shreveport after, as I said earlier on, attempting to kill his father. At this point, he'd broken into a house, he'd robbed a couple of $21, and then he'd traveled to Florida on a Greyhound bus. Anybody who's been traveling like I have, Greyhound buses are kind of how you get around. And it's here that he pitches a tent in the woods on the Florida University grounds. Not long after he arrives, five students are killed and the Gainesville killings begin. Back, however, to August 1990. So on August the 28th, that's the day after Tracy and Manny's brutal murders, and also two days after the bank robbery, Rowling is still living in the tent, in the wooded area owned by the University of Florida. He's not left, so I think we can all assume that the likelihood is he's planning on going nowhere and he's planning on carrying on the killings. Now, a police officer actually sees him, and sees him in a black male, in fact, entering the woods at 1 a.m. And he doesn't like what it looks like. So he calls for backup. The black male was Tony Danzi. He was a new friend of Rowling's who supplied him with drugs. The officers pursued the pair into the woods. They announced their presence. Dancy turns and faces the police. He totally remains where he was, obviously. He's not gonna run, he's not got anything to hide, essentially. Rowling, however, just flees into the woods. Officers basically lose track of him. Then they get police dogs. They search the woods again, and they soon discover Rowling's campsite. At this point, they find a raincoat and some red dye stained money on the ground. Then they search the tent, they find a tote bag on top of more dye stained money. So again, they can kind of see that this is adding up. Remember, there's been the bank robbery. Inside the bag, inside that tote bag that they find, there's a gun box. It contains a blue steel Taurus handgun plus a screwdriver, duct tape, a dark ski mask, and a cassette player with a tape inside it. Yeah. Officers at this point are like, wait, that has got to belong to the guy who robbed the bank. It's as simple as that. But for some reason, they don't actually at this point connect the evidence to the murders. And the reason for that is that there wasn't a gun used in the killings. And furthermore, for some inexplicable, bizarre reason, they don't listen to the tape. Is it just me? Is it just me that thinks that they were probably male officers? No disrespect, guys. Believe me, it's not intended in any way, shape or form. I'm just saying I don't think you're as nosy. Because out of all of those things, the first thing I would have done would have been like, I'm just going to play this tape. Even if it was only to discover a terrible taste in music, I would have done it. I'm just one of those people and all the women listening to me are agreeing at this moment in time. But for whatever reason, they're like, well, there's a screwdriver and there's a gun and there's duct tape. I mean, the fact that there's duct tape and they don't link the potential murderer is mind blowing because bank robberies don't tend to use duct tape and also if you've got a gun you don't need to use it to carry out the actual killing you just use it to threaten the person with so that they do what you say but straight over the head straight over the head at this point they're not linking it on the 6th of september 1990 what does happen though is the florida police arrest rolling but it's not in connection to the five killings that have taken place. Yeah, at this point, in spite of them not having really any evidence to connect Humphrey to the crime, he's still somehow the prime suspect, nor, bizarrely, was it in relation to the August bank robbery. No, it was because Rowling had basically robbed a supermarket in Acala City, Florida, and that was committed 10 days after Tracy and Manny's 
murder. There'd been this high-speed car chase. Rowling essentially crashed his car and then gets apprehended. So they have him, they just haven't linked the cases that they need to link to him as perpetrator. Now, around November 1990, the police basically get a tip-off from a Shreveport resident, Cindy Drekic. Her and her then-husband, they'd known Roland through their local church, and Roland had spent time with her family. In fact, for a while, he'd come to the home every single night. And during his time, he'd actually said some really worrying things to her husband. He said he had a problem and he liked to stick knives into people. Her husband basically told her, he has to go. I mean, yes, he has to go immediately. He's saying he likes to stick knives into people and we're having him round for food every night. Meaning that we are actually paying for him to eat food so that he can enjoy time with us as a family whilst potentially thinking about enjoying sticking knives into us. So clearly they act on that. But even though she's deeply uncomfortable with this, she really doesn't want to think that Rowlings is actually responsible for the Shreveport murders. However, she then heard about the Gainesville murders three months earlier while she was traveling through Florida and at this point, she kind of felt that there was a convincing argument that Roland could actually be the perpetrator. And at this point, she contacts Crime Stoppers and says to them, I think there's one guy y'all need to investigate, Danny Rowling. Which is correct, because Danny Rowling has been coming to your gaff and saying that he's got a penchant for, you know, stabbing knives into people. Obviously, I completely understand psychologically the bias where you like somebody and you look after somebody and they say crazy things and you don't connect it because you see the best in them. That is normal for humans. I'm not judging those individuals. They were doing their best and clearly sound like really nice people who actually went out of their way to support people in their community who had fallen on hard times. But I'm just saying, you know, if somebody comes to your house and you get to know them and then they're like, I have a bit of a problem. I like stabbing knives into people. You're like, speak to the police. Do it. You know what I always say? Risk to offend somebody. It may just save a life. No one should be talking about a problem where they stick knives into people. So once authorities have established that Rollins have got a history of committing robberies, they then realised that maybe he could be responsible for the August bank robbery. And on that day, that was when Chris's body had been found as well. So now the police revisit the evidence that they find at the campsite in the woods, which is near Florida University. And at this point, and at only this point, they think, hey, we haven't listened to the tape. We haven't, we haven't listened to the tape in the tape player that we found at the crime scene. On the tape, well, it appears that Rowling has done a bit of recording, a little bit of talking, a little bit of singing, because remember he's an aspiring country singer. And one of the songs included the line, Mystery rider, what's your name? You're a killer, a drifter, gone insane. He also discussed the most effective and efficient way to kill a deer. Best way, apparently, according to him on the tape, was to hit the lungs. Police kind of suspected at this point that he wasn't really referring to a deer. Incredibly, and very helpfully as well, he also decided on that tape to suggest that the individual who was actually speaking was in fact Danny Harold Rowling. Yeah, he literally said, I'm Danny Harold Rowling. So now the police know that it is definitely his evidence that they're dealing with because he literally has pinpointed himself. So it's clear to the police at this point that Rowling has definitely committed the bank robbery. It's bizarre to me that nobody thought about listening to the tape earlier. I know that people will be like, well, maybe they didn't think it would be of any interest. It's like, no, 
you eliminate. That's what you do. You eliminate or you discover. It's as simple as that. You don't just put it away in an evidence bag and be like, oh, who'd have thought that there might be a tape with some incriminating evidence in there, you know? It was at the scene of somebody who had been involved with a crime. And it would have meant that he'd been apprehended three months earlier, which is when you think about the extent of his killing and the escalation of his killing, how many bodies could have been counted in that time period? So we are talking about life and death situations. And the police soon trace Rowling to Marion County Jail because obviously he is already incarcerated. At this point, they take the blood sample. They establish that he's got the same blood type as the killer and that they're looking for. And his DNA also matches the DNA that's found at the crime scenes. And Manny's blood had also been detected on items at the campsite. So now they're really connecting the dots. January 1991. The police now announce that Rowling was the new prime suspect in both the Shreveport and Gainesville murders. The poor other guy, Ed Humphrey, is just like, am I free to go now? Am I free to go? Yes, we've ruined your life now. You can leave. I'm sure you'll be fine after spending nearly two years in a horrendous situation for something that you didn't deserve to actually be there for. But off you go. Get on with your life. September 1991. Rowling actually gets sentenced to life imprisonment for the supermarket robbery. And he was later given more life sentences in connection with various other robberies and also the burglaries that he's committed. November 1991, Rowling gets charged with the offences relating to the five Gainesville killings. Five counts of first degree murder, three counts of sexual battery, and three counts of armed burglary of a dwelling with a battery. Whilst he is incarcerated in Florida State Prison for these robbery offences, Rowling basically speaks to another inmate, a guy called Bobby Lewis, and he tells Bobby Lewis that he wants to confess to all his killings, and he gives him lots of details that only the killer would know. Lewis then writes a five-page letter and he outlines exactly what he's been told. So the investigators then arrange to meet with Rowling. And he wants Lewis to be present and to act as his mouthpiece during the meetings. Bizarre mentoring relationship, but whatever gets you a confession, I guess. So Lewis relays what he's been told. Rowling confirms those details and that's basically taken as a confession. And during the meeting, Rowling starts to tell the investigators that he dealt with various personalities his whole life. And he claims that this had been caused by his father's horrific abuse, that he'd been neglected, that he'd also been sexually abused in prison. And he also blamed his ex-wife. He said that he had these two very specific, darker personalities, as he put it. One was Yinad. That's actually Danny, spelled backwards. It's not exotic. Your nad is just Danny, spelled backwards. And basically, he's bad, but he's not evil. And the other one was Gemini. Now, Gemini was particularly sinister, and he was the one who was responsible for the murders. The investigators were like, yeah, yeah, I think that's BS. I think you're just trying to shift your blame. I think... You're completely aware of your faculties and you're just throwing in now this opportunity of, I'm totally insane. I, it wasn't me. It wasn't me at all. It was Gemini. You know, always go for a very dramatic name as well. A bit like Zodiac Killer, for example. So the prosecutors are not convinced and they allege when they're prosecuting him that all he had done was to basically think after watching some films that he could play this role. So he'd watched at the time of the killings, The Exorcist Part 3, in which basically a character is possessed by the spirit of the Gemini killer. In the film as well, just to know, the killer actually disembowels and decapitates a female victim. So it feels like maybe he'd even taken on the idea from there. Rowling did stress that he had definitely acted alone. He wanted to make it clear that Humphrey hadn't had any involvement. And as I said, that meant that Humphrey was subsequently cleared. Never got a public apology though. 
ever. Like I said, genuinely, it was just get on with your life. And the pain and anguish that he experienced and that his family experienced was far reaching. So despite the confessions to the Gainesville murders, one of the things that I'll tell you at this point is that Rowling's, in spite of all the evidence really adding up, just refused point blank to confess to the Shreveport killings. So as far as he was concerned, he was absolutely steadfast in saying that he had nothing to do with those killings, in spite of the fact that they were, I don't know, like identical, like identical. Like serial killers are very, very rare, but serial killers who wipe down the bodies of their victims with cleaning products are incredibly unusual, let alone to be active at the same time. Just saying. So 9th of June, 1992. Now this is despite the fact that they have got like overwhelming evidence, overwhelming, including a tape recorder with him literally identifying himself. Despite as well the fact that he's given a full confession, he's like, okay, I have confessed to the murders. I have recorded myself suggesting how I would kill a deer with incriminating evidence at same scene of said tape, having blood of victims, and also from the bank robbery. And I even got my mate in prison to tell the police my confession with me present, and essentially I've agreed that I've done all of these things. So now I'm going to court, I'm going to say I'm not guilty. Not guilty. Yeah. Suddenly, 9th June 1992, gets to court, it's like, yeah, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It's all guesswork, isn't it? All of that, it's just a bit of bad luck. A bit of bad luck, somebody probably nicking me tape player and I'd just been having a bit of a conversation and a bit of a sing song because I want to be a country singer. Yeah, he goes not guilty, which is just mind boggling. So 15th of February 1994, this is the first day of the trial because clearly there's now a trial he said that he wasn't guilty you got to go full hog on this he's basically like yeah i am guilty i am guilty yeah i am guilty i'm going to plead guilty to all counts tells the judge this your honor i've been running from first one thing and then another all my life but there are just some things that you can't run from this being one of them i'm not sure that you going guilty because you can't run from this anymore is because you can't run from this anymore. I think it's because the prosecution have got a very strong case and we all know what's happening to somebody who makes the court go ahead and go through an incredibly expensive trial and then you get found guilty. It's not gonna end well for you, is it? But anyway, he managed to say that to the judge and had his moment to, I suppose, shine as somebody realising the error of his ways, but nobody took that seriously at all. He also claimed that his main motive had been to want to become famous, like a superstar, like Ted Bundy. What is it with people who think that Ted Bundy is some kind of famous superstar? He was just a sadistic, killer and with respect as far a deeply insecure human being who genuinely was awkward to be around according to quite a lot of people who knew him but i digress that's a whole other case but that was his motivation and his plan had literally been to kill one person for each of the eight years he'd spent in prison in the 80s for his earlier robberies maybe he felt like he deserved to punish society because he'd had to be incarcerated, but that's his reasoning behind it. And later he goes on to admit that he didn't want the case to go to trial because he didn't want people to be shown the crime scene photos because one can argue that you would instantly be told death. You're getting the death sentence. There is no doubt whatsoever what you did to those poor victims makes it clear that you were planned, you were calculated, you were prepped with what you wanted to do, you carried out the most atrocious mutilation of bodies and then you posed it in a way that would traumatize the individuals who found them. Like, could you be any more diabolical? The answer is no, by the way. The answer is no. It's just a, it's a clear no. You couldn't be more diabolical. Simple as that awful 
At the penalty phase, that's in March 1994, the jury obviously had to make a decision what they consider to be recommended as a sentence, and they're all like, death. Immediately, death penalty, without a doubt. If you think about the aggravating facts in this, really, there couldn't ever have been any other outcome. I mean, man, the aggravating factors were huge. First of all, we've got Rowling's previous convictions from violent offences, so he's not learned anything. In fact, he's escalated. His murders were all premeditated. He'd stalked his victims. He'd gone and quit to break in, so he knew he was going to kill people. Very premeditated. Every single one of the murders was either heinous, atrocious, or cruel. So meets the aggravating factors there. Also, he'd put his victims through the most unimaginable terror and he'd enjoyed it. He told them exactly what he was going to do to them. Juries then were shown pictures of their slashed and chipped bones so they could see that there was an utter ferocity around how he'd stabbed them. Also, the murders had been committed during the commission of a sexual assault, so they were hugely aggravating factors. Now, there were mitigating factors in this case and they were taken into account. So, when they assessed Rowling, they found that he had the emotional age of a 15-year-old. He'd committed the crimes whilst he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance. He had a massively dysfunctional background that you all are aware of because of what I've talked about. That was taken into account. And without a doubt, he had suffered horrific trauma from his childhood because of the physical and mental abuse. Also, witnesses testified to the fact that they had seen that abuse. So it wasn't just Rowling saying it, people came in and unequivocally agreed that he had had a heinous childhood. And his family, interestingly enough, also had a history of mental illness. They also noted that Rowling's particular mental impairment had an impact on his behaviour, on his impact about how to act in a socially acceptable manner. And finally, even though it was at the very last minute, he did plead guilty to all counts and that meant that they avoided the need for the trial. But in spite of all of those mitigating factors, the aggravating ones totally outweighed them. So the judge absolutely agreed there was only one sentence and that is death. On March 1997, he appealed against his sentence and it was unsuccessful. I mean, what was he expecting? I know it's just par for the course. I do know, I know it's par for the course, particularly where the death sentence is concerned, you appeal the sentence, but you're not gonna get a different outcome. You could not get somebody if you were gonna say that the death sentence is viable and that there is a certain marker to mean that you deserve it. He's got to be in that top 0.0001% as far as deserving it, isn't he? Because it's rare that anybody else could ever do anything worse than what he's done because it's excruciatingly evil, excruciatingly evil. Prior to him actually being executed, Rowling handed a handwritten note to a pastor and in that, well, yeah, he admits to the 1989 Grissom murders in Shreveport and he does actually apologize for his actions is it just me? I have a little bit of, shall we say, bias, my own judgment, shall we say, about why people do this in those last moments. Because I think that some people are like, I have been a complete horror of a human. Like genuinely, I have been, when it comes down to a spectrum of who I could have been versus what I have been, I am next to the devil. And now I'm like mapped to meet my maker and I don't really want to go down. And I'm hoping that all that stuff about, you know, forgiveness and atoning for my sins and taking responsibility and being forgiven will mean that I end up going up, shall we say. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that it doesn't surprise me that just before he's going to get put to death, he's like, I did kill those people because then he's admitted it and he can be absolved of his sins. I don't think he will have been though. Just saying, personal belief system. He actually gets executed by lethal injection. That's on the 25th of October, 2006. 
He was aged 52, that's 16 years after he committed the murders. His youngest victim, that lovely little boy, eight-year-old Sean, he would have turned 25 the day before. Many of the families of his victims, they actually went to watch him die. He gave no last words. Instead, he sang his own gospel hymn in which he repeated the line, none greater than thee, O Lord. Interesting, but crack on, I guess. Crack on, if that's what you want to do. I'd have just thought maybe a nice apology to the families per se, but no, you just sing yourself a little bit of a lullaby. He gets pronounced dead 13 minutes after he started singing. He was the 63rd person executed since Florida reinstated the death penalty in 1973. I think that I have to pose this question. Do we have some sympathy for Rowling as far as who created him? You know, it is possible, isn't it, to feel sorry for the abuse that he suffered at the hands of his father, of course, but it does not provide any near excuse or reasoning for his crimes. Many, many people, unfortunately, suffer similar abuse, worse abuse. But they don't become monsters. In fact, they become the opposite. They become healers, they become empaths, they become doctors, nurses, they become people who have great impact on this world to prevent others from suffering. It's what motivates them. So that's not a reason. For me, it feels like, yeah, there was to some degree a perfect storm of ingredients in Rowling's case to create a killer, you know? He was, di he was actually diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and paraphilia. Having said that, let me make it clear, I've worked with many people with borderline personality disorder and they are some of the nicest human beings that exist, albeit they have an issue with some impulse control sometimes and they have an issue with regulating their emotions sometimes, but with respect, BPD does not create killers. Antisocial personality disorder, well, that's different. We often see people who are violent offenders getting diagnosed with that and certainly the paraphilia is clear sexually because of the way that he acted with with those women violently and afterwards with post-mortem mutilation and sex. In Gainesville, more than 30 years after the deaths, a simple memorial to Rollins' victims remains. The wall just displays the five students' names. Interestingly, Rowling was never actually tried for the 1989 Shreveport murders. They actually officially closed that file in March 1994. I guess the fact that he said he did it and it will have brought at least closure and understanding to some degree to the family who was left behind. But I imagine that it would have been helpful for them to have had him officially charged and at least acknowledged in the way that they could have known that he was recognized as that killer. Essentially, they know he was, but like I said, sometimes the ritual of having a trial can be really, really helpful for the individuals who suffered losses. It makes them feel that the people that they've lost were given a sense of legacy. It means that their murders were recognized as murders and that the individual who had carried them out was tried accordingly, albeit that in this case, he was going straight to hell anyway. Like I said at the beginning, some of you will know this case, but I would hope that many of you aren't aware of this particular killer. It is brutal, isn't it, when you think about the kind of level of horror that was inflicted on these poor victims, but also for those who were traumatised by what they saw when the bodies were discovered. And it also speaks to the reality that there are these human predators out there whose predilection are so dark, so dire, so dangerous, that human beings just going to sleep in their own homes at night can end up prey to these individuals. It's just terrifying. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Give me a like if you've liked it. Leave me a comment if you wanna express an opinion or tell me more about some of these things that you might have heard of in relation to this crime. Subscribe if you want to. I'm wearing my merch, nice red, no comment. Please do have a look at what's available. And remember, the most important thing that we always take from when we cover a serial killer 
and what they tell us about what makes a perfect victim is individuals who are vulnerable, available and desirable. You can't do anything about being desirable, but remember, always recognize that in circumstances where somebody comes to attack you, never comply. I have literal tops saying, do not comply. But truly, if you want to survive a serial killer, that is the rule. Do not comply. I hope this guy's burning in hell. I'm sure that he'll be in some kind of row of other serial killers and people like Hitler who will just be like steaming at the heads where they're constantly at like a thousand degrees C on a daily, probably even higher at the weekends. Is that just me who creates things like that in my head? <laughs> Take care. See you soon. Thanks for listening.